Okay, we'll go ahead and start this uh, session. Let me uh, just remark that uh, at this point we have left a series of 45 five-minute contributions. So we want to move along rapidly. I'm going to set the timer uh, at two and a half minutes, and that will give you another two and a half minutes. Uh, so please try to be very succinct. The uh, first talk is research on high TC oxide superconductors at Argonne. This contribution will be given by uh, Dr. Uh, Bobby Dunlap. In case those of you who haven't been in this business since the beginning of time, which was three months ago, I offer you this little picture to sort you through the conductor, semiconductor, superconductor, and 90 degree superconductor, just so you can keep everything straight. At Argonne, it's been a little intense. There have been a few people busy. Uh, I can't say, in all honesty, that all of these people have been working full time, but I can say, in all honesty, that all of these people have made some substantive contribution to what's been going on in this business. Uh, I also, how, instead of, uh, was suggested that maybe it's a good idea that instead of thanking any individuals or trying to read any indiv individuals' names, I give special thanks to the wives and children of the people who put up with the madness that's been going on recently. Uh, I don't know how I can really do justice to what's happened in, in several months in five minutes' time. I show you here a list of preprints that are currently available. They're coming at about one a week or something like that. Uh, essentially, all of these are on the 40-degree compound, at the, at the, that is, those which are written uh, and put down here. And I can only really pick and choose two or three things here since, I, uh, as I say, there really isn't time to go into all of it. Uh, let me just say that certainly what we're interested in is mechanisms and in trying to get the uh, uh, trying to get some essential properties out experimentally and uh, try to help clarify mechanisms. We have, for example, tunneling data. This is point contact tunneling data. It's it's really rather clean. Uh, and just to to point at the critical figure, if you want to think in terms of electron phonon interactions, which is which is. Uh, perhaps a way to at least begin to start to think about them. You see that the value of 2 delta over KTC here is in the range of 5 to 9, which is certainly in the strong coupling limit. That is to compare uh, with uh, 3.5 in the BCS theory. Uh, we also have phonon data. Uh, here is a phonon density of states. This is a somewhat moving target uh, because the data is still coming along and it's being analyzed, but this is the result of taking some Raman data, some IR data, some neutron diffraction, uh, inelastic neutron scattering data, and a born von Karman type calculation and cranking all of it together. And this will continue. Uh, this will provide you, thank you very much. <laughs> this will certainly allow us to at least try to get somewhere uh, into uh, some evaluation of how good the um, electron phonon interactions may be. There is information on electronic structure. Here are some exanes data, and I don't have time to go through it, except to tell you that the conclusion of this data is clearly that there is both copper 2 plus and copper 3 plus present in this material. Um, in the high temperature data, uh, in the high temperature superconductor, what I want to show you is some phase diagram work. Uh, here is a phase diagram to complement what Bertram showed you before. Uh, what, what happened is that uh, our people looked at the, what have been reported as known superconductors, including the green compound and, and a few other things, and proceeded to make something in excess of 200 compounds, uh, sorting through the ternary phase diagram. And, and the purples, which you see here, are non-superconducting mixed phase materials. The reds are superconducting mixed phase materials. And if you look at this in, in some detail, you can see there are one, two, three, four uh, uh, single phase materials. And you can understand quite clearly where all of the mixed phases are and so forth. And they do all focus on what everyone else seems to have come to as well. The single phase, the single phase being the yttrium barium 2 copper 3 oxygen X. We have on this material X-ray diffraction, neutron diffraction, transport critical currents, Meissner effects, all of the things you have to have. What I want to emphasize at the moment is that we do have some very detailed, high-resolution neutron diffraction data on these materials, and that is in the process of being analyzed for the structure. 
at the moment, I would not say that we can say from that data that, that we have the structure because uh, certainly the, the neutron data does not fit to, to any simple models, although I would like to, to see in more detail the model that uh, Paul Chu showed and uh, so that we could apply that and see how it works out with the neutron data as well. And then finally, let me say that uh, as of uh, two days ago, <coughs> We do have a single crystal of yttrium barium-2, copper-3, oxygen. Uh, roughly half millimeter by half millimeter crystals have been made. They have large Meissner effects approaching 100%. Uh, the data is a little sloppy at the moment because it's, it's under process and I've been working by telephone, but it certainly has uh, critical temperatures in excess of 85 degrees. Uh, thank you, Bob. The uh, next contribution is magnetization studies uh, of high TC superconductors. This uh, presentation is given by uh, Professor Doug Finnemore. I'll start off with the uh, conclusions, in case there's any doubt. Um, lutetium barium copper oxide is indeed a superconductor. TC is 90 Kelvin. The samples we've made uh, show 20% of full flux exclusion as you cool in temperature in a constant field. If you have pinning, of course, you don't expect full flux exclusion. In the yttrium barium copper oxide, we were actually working with the 327 compound, thinking that that was the right stuff. When we started this, it has T, there's obviously a phase with TC of uh, 91 Kelvin. It shows again 34, shows 34% of full Meissner effect. And uh, flux pinning at low fields, and I would like to spend a little time concentrating on the magnetization curves and how irreversible they are. The 40-degree um, superconductor is very reversible, and you can get free energy curves from that. Okay, the lutetium barium copper oxide was submitted to FISREV letters on the 2nd of March, and it's a joint Brookhaven-Ames effort. Arnie uh, Mudenbau called Bob... Uh, Shelton and said that he had superconductivity in this material and they started a collaboration with the uh, Mudenbau, Suunaga, Asano, Cox and the names that Shelton, Koo, McCallum and Clavins working on it. The, uh, now this is a uh, 214 mixture which is not the right mixture for this but cooling in a field you can see this is the first data they took and so superconductivity onset comes at about 90 Kelvin, but not a very f large fraction of the sample goes. Sort of an intriguing effect in this particular sample is that if, as you cool on down, there appears to be an antiferromagnetic transition, which we associate with a piece of second phase in the same material, but it's a very sharp drop. And just to complete uh, the electrical resistance for this material, comes down, as you can see, drops to zero at a temperature substantially lower than where uh, the Meissner effect onset comes. That's the green line at 91, and I've drawn the red line just in case you want to be optimistic. <laughs> I like to define a quantity called T sub MOP, which is T sub most optimistic point. Uh, the group also set out to do the one, two, three phase, and uh, the x-ray pattern for this still obviously has some copper oxide in, still obviously has some lutetium copper oxide, and then the main phases are in black. Got two and a half minutes. Thank you. And Arnie Mudenbau is giving a talk on that later tonight, on all of that work. Now, the flux pinning work is done by the uh, Ames group only, and just a quick tutorial. If you measure magnetization curves, you have the Meissner region at low field. And if in normal material like Niagara 310, you'd get a large amount of hysteresis. And delta B gives you a measure of the pinning in the material, as related by the equation I showed there. If there's no pinning, you get the free energy. And if there is pinning, you get the uh, JC. And so it's valuable whichever way the result comes out. And in the lanthanum strontium, it's extremely reversible. And uh, 4 pi m is a function of h. 
the open circles are increasing field, decreasing field, and you can get the free energy out of those data, and it's published uh, rapid communication April 1. You can look all those data up. In the yttrium barium, we had great joy from the Bell Labs group in uh, 1,100 amps per square centimeter. And the sample I'm going to describe for you was actually this 327 sample, which goes at 91 Kelvin. Lee G took these data. These are AC susceptibility. I assure you these are not arbitrary units. It really is 34% uh, machines calibrated. And the same sample, if you exclude flux, as you cool down, it does indeed exclude flux. That's no surprise. But what I want to show you is the uh, pinning. So this is a magnetization curve at 10 Kelvin, which is pretty low temperature. And if you take the point at uh, about half a Tesla, you get 96 amps per square centimeter. But I would like to point out as you go up to 2 Tesla, which is a still a very small field, the pinning goes away. So saying things happen at zero field is not a good indication of the practical use of this material at higher fields. The pinning really gets much smaller. And if you go to 78 Kelvin, it's even, it's even less friendly. It's much more reversible. And at 78 Kelvin, increasing and decreasing fields. So that I think we have a lot of hard work. Now, the worry is that we have weak links between grains. And I think we should focus on these weak links between grains. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. Uh, next talk is studies of lanthanum copper oxide, lanthanum strontium copper oxide, and related compounds, contributions given by Dr. David Johnston. Well, I think, <clears throat> can you hear me? I think I'll switch gears and talk about magnetism here because um, that seems to be an issue which needs to be resolved with regard to um, its influence on the superconductivity and the mechanism. So uh, uh, you won't see any TC curves here. Uh, plotted in the top, just to remind you, is the log of the resistance versus temperature for the pure lanthanum N member. Um, what we've done was take an oven-cooled sample, which has some nominal uh, stoichiometry of oxygen in it, and cool it up, up to 700 Kelvin. And we know from gra gravimetric measurements that uh, above about 500 Kelvin, it loses oxygen. And what, do we have a pointer? Uh, what we see here <clears throat> is uh, an irreversible change to a state which uh, is much more resistive. And again, as I mentioned, from gravimetric measurements, uh, we know that uh, we lose oxygen, and uh, the amount that is lost is roughly on the order of a tenth, uh, one, one atomic percent. A couple of, couple of things. You've heard about the localization at low temperatures. Um, there is an inflection point here. Uh, this is the temperature of the orthorhombic to tetragonal phase transition. And OK, in the lower curve, I've plotted the magnetic susceptibility versus temperature for the pure end member uh, treated in various ways. Uh, typically, we turn the oven off and just let the samples cool. And what happens when you do that is you get a susceptibility that uh, has this kind of behavior. You have a low temperature tail just due to copper 2 plus defects. You have a little feature here, which we don't understand yet. And then we have what looks to be like an antiferromagnetic transition. Uh, however, <clears throat> if you take the sample that we ran up to 700K under vacuum and, and run it, uh, what you get is this curve. So clearly, the magnetic interactions are extremely strongly related to the oxygen stoichiometry. But you can also go the other way. <clears throat> If you, if you put the sample under 600 pounds of, of oxygen at 700 K, uh, essentially it disappears. Might be surprising, but one can get quite a strong electron spin resonance sig signal out of these materials. 
this, this is a, uh, an oven cooled LA2CuO4. <clears throat> the intensity after double integration of the spectrum gives approximately one spin and a half per copper with a G of about two. Under vacuum of 750, which turns it into an insulator, uh, you get this kind of a spectrum. It's a little bit different. And when you dope it with strontium, you get uh, still um, a different signal, but the point that I'd like to make here is that it appears to be a superposition of a local magnetic moment and a broad uh, Dysonian uh, peak due to the conduction electrons. Well, <clears throat> when you think you have magnetic order, uh, you do neutron diffraction. So, th so that's what this is. Uh, we cooled the LA2CO4 down to 15K, and a new, a new peak occurred at the, the old crystallographic 100 position. Uh, and its intensity is a function of temperature as shown here. So uh, the question is, what kind of transition is it? Is it crystallographic or magnetic? So the x-rays show no 100 peak. So evidently, that means it's antiferromagnetic. And from the intensity of the peak, um, the moment on the copper is one, about one bar magneton per copper. <clears throat> now this is really interesting. Here's what happens when you, when you add, add strontium. Uh, you go from a curve that looks like this to a curve that looks like this and then like this. But if you look at it, look at the high temperature data, you see a piece that's coming in like this in each of them, uh, and you see a piece that's temperature independent. That is, one might do that decomposition. And uh, it, the shape of the, of the curve suggests that uh, you have a gap in the system and the gap is decreasing with, dec with increasing x. Um, the heat capacity at the transition uh, shows no particular feature, which is a little surprising, actually. <coughs> I might point out <coughs> some really interesting data that Shobo Bhattacharya took in the ultrasonic attenuation. Uh, this is a change in the sound velocity as a function of temperature. And this is an 8% change we're seeing over, over this temperature range. Uh, I guess the Argon group uh, has reported um, a lot of transformation occurring there. But if you look at this curve, it's really interesting. The sample's actually appearing to get softer as you cool, and then it transforms to a phase that, that is even softer than that. So that's kind of unusual. Okay, so to summarize in one minute, <clears throat> it appears that LA2CO4 has a, has a, in, uh, the, the copper is in a spin and a half to equal to ground state. Antiferromagnetic ors, order occurs near 300K or below, depending on the stoichiometry. But the one point I'd like to test out on you here, and experimentalists and theorists alike, is that <clears throat> uh, we would speculate that the strontium and barium dope samples contain a dense array of local moments uh, in coexistence with itinerant holes. Um, this has many ramifications. Thank you. Thank you, David. The uh, next talk is uh, Far Infrared Properties of High TC Superconductors. It's given by Paul Saluski. First of all, I'd like to thank our many collaborators at Cornell University, Belcor, Standard Oil, and Temple. Um, as many people have already mentioned, uh, measuring the gap is a very important thing to do. And it can be measured either by tunneling or by far infrared spectroscopy.
Uh, first, we'll just summarize some systematics observed for the, the three superconducting systems. All three of the systems have uh, a gap, two delta over KTC, which is less than the BCS prediction of 3.5. Uh, and we'll focus on the lanthanum strontium copper oxide in this talk. Schematically, if you plot the surface reactants as a function of frequency, for a normal uh, metal, you get a Druda type behavior. And for a superconductor, below uh, 2 delta, there can be no absorptivity. And then there's an onset of absorptivity. And a crossing here, which uh, where the reactants of the superconductor is greater than that of the normal metal. So if we plot the R sub S minus R sub N, the difference in the surface reactants, we see this kind of a behavior where there's a, a, a large increase below uh, going negative and then crossing the axis and going positive. And uh, these two pieces have equal areas. That's due to a sum rule by Brandley uh, written down in 1972. Now, the, the um, variation in numbers here isn't a uh, sample dependent thing. It's, it's just that it depends where we choose um, to define 2 delta. Is it the peak, or is it the inflection point, or is it the crossing? And you'll see that uh, data. So just before we go to the data, if um, we try to uh, think about the Holstein process or an electron-phonon interaction, we can write down an expression uh, following Allen for the scattering rate of the normal state and a similar expression for the superconducting state. Uh, and just to mention, if you have elastic scattering, you can use the same formalism and replace the alpha squared f, which is the electron phonon coupling constant times the density of states, by a delta function expressing elastic scattering. So now we'll go to the data um, on the lanthanum strontium. First, you'll see the reflectivity squared because we have two samples uh, that we reflect off of. And the solid curve is the normal state at 41K, and the dash curve is the 4.2 superconducting data. Uh, you'll see it's, it's remarkably you know, smooth. It's, it's great data. Um, so if we extract the surface resistance from this data, uh, there's really zero absorptivity, and then an onset here. And it, it crosses the normal state <coughs> absorptivity, as you can see. Now, if we can plot the difference in the resist, uh, surface resistance, uh, we get this, the bottom curve here. And you can see that the areas are nicely conserved. So we believe that we've really extended out to the relevant frequency because all the area is accounted for. Now, if you take that elastic scattering model that I wrote down from Allen, you get this dashed curve as a fit. And you can see that um, there really is something interesting going on here, that, that uh, there's this huge peak. And it's, it's you know, much greater than anything that you would see from just the elastic case. And it's much more compressed in frequency space than in the prediction. I can take that and compare it to, say, lead. And you'll see that the, the dash curve is for an alloy of lead. And it, it really looks quite like the elastic um, prediction. So something interesting is going on here. Now, if we take, um, if we look at, say, the difference in surface reactants for pure lead, you can see that it's got this interesting structure here. And this is just we're looking, looking at the phonons coming into the determination of the surface resistance. You, know, you can take this. And the first derivative of this is uh, roughly proportional to the uh, alpha squared f, the, the electron phonon coupling. And for the pure lead, you get the solid curve multiplied by 10 times, just so you can see it on the same scale. So there's the large elastic peak at 2 delta due to impurity scattering. And then the phonon structure for pure lead. So if we um, take our our data for the lanthanum strontium and perform the same derivative, then we see the large elastic peak or maybe quasi-elastic peak. And then there's some tiny 
little structures there which may be important, but uh, you can see that they, they're in sort of the right order of magnitude. If you squash this down by a factor of 10, then, then those are uh, bigger, but they may be something there. But um, the key is that we can take this point as, as the gap, 2 delta, and then um, that gives us about um, 2 delta over KTC is about 2.7 for that, which is sort of the upper limit that we can take. If you choose the crossing, um, over here or the, the minimum here, you can get a different value, but it's, it's definitely not 3.5 KTC, which would be much higher. So uh, I think we'd like to stress uh, stress in conclusion that we've measured the uh, frequency dependent reflectivity in the far infrared for these high temperature superconductors and that Systematically, no matter which one we look at, we see 2 delta over KTC is much smaller than BCS. About 2 would be a good uh, round number. And we see that uh, the difference in the reactance's surface resistance obeys the sum rule. Thank you. Thank you. Next talk is uh, TC, HC2, and structure of oxide superconductors. Uh, this talk is given by uh, Dr. Laura Green. This work is done in collaboration with our group from Belcor, TC, HC2, and single crystal structure of oxide superconductors. The MIT group has measured the HC2, and the single crystal structure is performed by Yvonne Lepage at NRC Ottawa. There are many other collaborations going on right now with us, and here's a list of some of them now. Most of these talks are being given today, um, but feel free to discuss any of these measurements with myself or any of these authors. In our first paper of lanthanum, strontium, copper oxide, we found that annealing and oxygen can enhance the TC. Here we have a material 1.85.15, which we know is the optimum for this material with this doping level. And as grown is the blue line for resistance versus temperature. By annealing an oxygen, we're able to increase the TC to about 41 and a half degrees. Subsequent annealing in a vacuum will reduce the TC again. So this process is reversible. The composition dependence, that is doping with the strontium, is shown here. We have resistivity plotted as a function of temperature for the lanthanum strontium copper oxide material. Note first the surprisingly linear resistivities along this regime above the TCs. Note also that as one dopes the strontium, with the strontium by taking electrons out, the room temperature resistivity starts to decrease. That is, the conductivity increases one would expect for a doping effect. Conversely, the, um, conversely, the slope is uh, decreased with, with increased doping, which is the opposite one would, effect, would expect for the doping effect. This is in contrast to our rare earth substitution work in the lanthanum strontium copper oxides. Here we've doped with the lanthanides in rare earths, as shown here. Note these also have surprisingly linear resistivities throughout the temperature range up to room temperature. Now in, this, in these with the rare earth dopings, we find the room temperature resistivities are all comparable, and the slopes of all these materials uh, in resistivity are all about the same. The main difference here is that the TCs are pushed down and not are pushed down as one dopes along the rare earth uh, row from 36.8 midpoint down to 18.5 for the gadolinium midpoint. We believe that this reduction in TC is not due to a magnetic doping effect, but is due to volume change with the doping. The upper critical fields of these materials are shown here. These are the measurements. The red line is the onset of superconductivity, and the blue line is the midpoint of the resistive transition in the lanthanum strontium copper oxide materials. This is the 0.15 again. Um, note that at 22 tesla, the TCs are, for the onset and the midpoint, are 34 and 28 Kelvin respectively. For the yttrium barium material of our early work, we uh, show the same curves, the red being the onset of, superconduct the onset 
of the transition, and the blue line being the midpoint of the resistance transition. And again, at 22 uh, Tesla, we find that TCs are dropped 91 for the onset and 73 for the midpoint. I've summarized the HC2 values in the following table, extrapolated down to zero temperature. The numbers are printed in Tesla. Note the surprising result, very neutrium compound, agreeing with the earlier Bell Labs presentation, is that the, the, at zero temperature, one extrapolates to between 175 and 325 Tesla, which is one of the highest materials, highest TC material, HC2 material seen to date. I'd also like to point out that the pulse field data was done at 45 Tesla. The lanthium strontium material was measured at 4.2 K. The barium yttrium material measured at 77 K. And in both cases, a fraction of the material is still superconducting at 45 Tesla. For historical reasons, this is our first yttrium barium copper oxide material measured in February. Um, the material was fabricated on January 3, 1987. I'd like to point out that this also has a typical resistive midpoint of about 91 degrees. Since then, we've isolated the phase and grown single crystals. And the results of the single crystal x-ray diffraction are, are presented here. This was done on a 40 by 30 by 15 micron crystal. We have significantly larger in the millimeter, millimeters range right now of single crystals. Um, this, is the, this is the material that some people agree and disagree with on the oxygen. Um, it is orthorhombic, and it remains orthorhombic down to 90 degrees without any further structural change. I'd like to point out that what we have here, there are oxygens missing on the yttrium uh, planes, which gives us three copper planes. So it's a 2D electronic structure. If there, are if there are further oxygen vacancies, which we believe are as high as one here, they would occur in this basal plane between the bariums. Notice also the slight uh, distortion that remains down to 90 degrees of the oxygen being pushed slightly higher in these planes. Thank you very much. OK, this uh, set of papers is open for discussion. So can we raise the lights? Or turn them on, rather? Yes. Eike Weber from UC Berkeley. Uh, some of the behavior which we heard about reminds me on earlier ESR measurements we did on mixed valence compounds. And of course, you know, a lot of research has been put into mixed valence compounds with the idea to come to the high TCs. So my question is, is there any indication that you have valence instabilities and that you could call these compounds having some properties of mixed valence compounds. It's basically to everybody who has some data on that. We don't really have um, data right now on what the valence is. Oh, hello. Uh, we don't know exactly what the valence is for measurements. We, we believe from preliminary um, XPS measurements, it's between two and three for the copper. Um, the question of mixed valence is a time scale problem. So I think further work needs to be done to nail this down completely. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, could I just oh, yes, sorry, comment, Bob. Yes. Brian? As I showed you, uh, the Exane's data indicates that there is both trivalent and divalent copper in this material. But I agree with Laura that there's a time scale question. Whether you want to call that a mixed valent material or not is a question. Hanson, uh, Westinghouse. Uh, by what crystal growing techniques were the uh, yttrium barium uh, perovskite crystals grown? Um, as reported in, in our paper, it's, it's the same that almost everyone else does. We, I think one of the keys is reacting the material as a powder and not as a pellet. And having Jean Marie make the crystals, I think, is the, uh, the major key. He's really. Okay, try to speak louder if you could, yes. Uh, uh, Malazimov from IBM for the Argon Group. How did you grow your single crystal? Huh. <laughs> uh, 
I must apologize because I'm, as I said, I'm working. I'm working by telephone, and this stuff is coming harder, faster than I can keep up with. And I don't really know the details and how the crystal was grown because it was done after I left. I am presuming that it was done by a flux growth technique, which is how we prepared the single, the previous crystals in the strontium lanthanum system. I can't tell you what the flux was at this point. Yes, Paul. Uh, Paul Gray on IBM Alvin Den. This question is for Dr. Green. Uh, both you and AT&T Bell uh, find a structure in which the uh, yttrium plane is, is, absence of, is absent from oxygen. I'm wondering that if, uh, the, oxygen, if the yttrium is still 3 plus, it would seem that it would want to collect a lot of negative charge around it. I'm curious about what you think on that matter. And also, there seems to be a lot of room for the yttrium to move around. And I wonder if you measure the thermal ellipsoids of the, of the atoms in your unit cell. Um, there wasn't a large thermal motion for the yttrium, so we don't have a lot of evidence that they're moving around. As far as the valence goes, I think that's still an unanswered question. We believe that the yttrium has to remain 3 plus in this material. We haven't thought it through well enough since this is going so quickly, but the valences do add up if one assumes that the copper goes between 2 and 3 in this particular material, with oxygen being 8 minus between 8 and 7. As far as where they are in that layer, I'm not sure yet. See, there's a question way in the back. John Clem from Ames Laboratory. This is a question for Dr. Saluski. Were the IR measurements made on materials as prepared or were they sliced through or cleaved to get down to the middle of the grain? Both. Both. Any, any um, difference in the two measurements? Uh, well, the, the sample that uh, was from Belcor was sliced through. Yes? Uh, yes. Yes. And uh, that was the best sample. And we've also taken samples as grown and they show kind of a smaller effect, the same gap but uh, not as big a change in the resistivity, kind of as if uh, maybe there are areas that are not superconducting. And then uh, if we polish it, just sort of with 600 grit sandpaper, um, nothing really changes. Nothing dramatic happens. Um, also, the skin depth is really very large for our measurements since the absorptivity is so large. We estimate somewhere between 1 and 10 microns for the skin depth. So we're really probing the bulk superconductivity. It's not a surface effect we're looking at. So I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Okay, second microphone from the back. Uh, T. Jabda, South Carolina. Question to the single crystal researchers. Uh, did I hear you correctly uh, mentioning that the uh, transition temperature for the single crystal was about 86 degrees Kelvin? If so, why is this uh, lower than the 90 or odd degrees that we hear for, from other researchers? I'll go first because I have the microphone here. Our, our single crystals are the 90 degree. <laughs> what I said is that our single crystals are in excess of 85 degrees, and, the, and, the, and again, since the crystal is new and it's there, and I'm here. I can't tell you exactly what its transition is. I, right. <laughs> uh, that's the best I can do at the moment. Sorry. OK, the man with the red folder. How about that? Yeah. <laughs> last year, University of Wisconsin. A question for Dr. The, uh You raised the question of percolation and showed the critical current uh, density or uh, irreversible behavior, which was quickly killed in field. Do you think that this is particular to the, to the modes of preparation, or do you think that this is intrinsic to these low-dimensional uh, conductors? Uh, <laughs> It's, a, it's endemic in the lanthanum strontium materials. They're all very low, and you can make materials which have very clean boundaries. The yttrium barium seems to be much more forgiving, and we've only made a few samples, and they are surely a far cry from a single phase. So I think that improvement in the quality of the crystal will greatly enhance the pinning, but I don't know. It may get worse. I have a question right there? Yes. Bob Markowitz, Northeastern. Do these uh, single crystals show anisotropic properties, resistivity, and so on? We, uh, that is in progress right now, both the uh, magnetic properties and the resistance properties, since it's so recent. They haven't been measured as of yet. We've only measured the resistivity and powders of the single crystal centered so far, but ask me in about a, two days. And everybody else, too. 
here. See any other answers, or is that? <laughs> uh, from the reflectivity data that's been reported, um, I really believe that we'll see significant anisotropic properties in these materials, and also from the crystal structure. Okay, yes. Well, certainly the lanthanum strontium samples don't decompose. They're very stable. Uh, we've never had any trouble with the yttrium barium. Others can speak for themselves. The, the only thing we found is that off stoichiometry, if left for a long, the yttrium barium, the lanthanum are very stable. Off stoichiometry, if left for a couple of days or longer than a day at 950, there is some decomposition. Okay. Or even on stoichiometry. That's it. Okay, way in the back, there's a question. Ted Jabal from Stanford. I'd like to know how high in frequency the far infrared experiments were carried out. We've measured up to about 800 wave numbers or 850. Any structure? Um, there is a kind of an interesting structure at about 800, I mean, at about uh, 650 wave numbers, sort of a, a peak that occurs in the low temperature, but it goes away before you reach um, anywhere near the critical temperature. So uh, we're not really sure what it's due to, but it's not something that's uh, crucial for the superconductivity since it just goes away um, at maybe maybe eight degrees. You, you see it at around four degrees, and then it goes away by eight degrees. OK, any other questions? Yeah, two more. Yes, OK. Um, my name is Yi Song from the Ohio State University. I have a question to Dr. Saluski. Uh, in your far infrared measurements, you mentioned that you apply a magnetic field much larger, well, I mean, just larger than HC2. But according to what we know so far, HC2 is so large. No, 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 I'm sorry. That was sort of a schematic picture to show you if you had a perfect superconductor. Right. Um, and you could apply a field greater than HC2. That's what you would observe. What we do is we raise the temperature above the critical temperature. So we go from 4.2 to 41 in the lanthanum strontium case. Oh, OK. And so, there's so an assumption that uh, the resistivity doesn't change much. And that's, that's pretty good. So, OK, so you actually didn't measure uh, the sample at the same temperature, but rather you, you, you compare them between right. 4 and the 41. Right. OK, thank you. Uh, I have Cy Foner from the Magnet Lab. I have a question for Doug Finnamore. Uh, our experience with the uh, uh, strontium compounds are that they have substantial critical currents based on magnetic measurements in a number of materials from different uh, sources. And I'm just wondering whether the particular material you looked at was granular versus uh, having continuous contacts for the other materials. Um, we'd have to look in detail at the microstructure. I haven't seen yours. When we look at them, we can talk about it. But if you look at the hysteresis loops, if you get a very big loop and it tells you a few thousand amps per square centimeter, you figure that you have uh, uh, a better conductor. Sure. You have better samples. Possibly. Okay, maybe we can move along. Uh, Neil Ashcroft has uh, some remarks to make. Uh, my remarks, ladies and gentlemen, at this point uh, will reveal a certain uh, terminological insecurity. I understand that after sitting at a baseball game for a long time, there is a custom known as a seventh inning stretch. Am I correct? I suggest that as the next team is being assembled, we do that, whatever it is. <laughs> 